So we're now going to look at continuous probability distributions. So earlier we looked at discrete ones. And so let's just recap our definitions of what have you. So remember a random variable, which often we call capital X, that's the, the quantity in the basically in the stats. So the score is another word for it. And then we create a probability distribution, um, which is a listing of all the possible values that X can take and their probabilities. So here's a simple little example. Eggs in a supermarket sold in a box of six. X is going to represent the number of broken eggs in a box. And so the probability distribution is something like this. So apparently there's no chance that every egg will be broken or five of the eggs will be broken. Mind you, you'd still feel a little bit ripped off if four of them were broken. <laughs> okay, so that is a probability distribution. And so properties of the probability of x equaling little x, well, we know it's always going to be a positive number. We're talking about a, a probability. And we know the sum of all the probabilities should equal one. Uh, if the probability is the same, so for instance, rolling a dice, probability of a one, two, three, and so on, then we'd say that it's a uniform distribution. Okay, so what we saw with discrete random variables, the expected value was the sum of that row, the x times the, the px. And again, so that's where our probability is obviously greater than or equal to zero. It turned out that that was the same as just the average or the mean of the data. And that's what we call a measure of central tendency. So roughly where the middle of the data is. So back to our eggs. So if we're going to buy 10 boxes, how many broken eggs would we expect to have? So I now add in that XPX column, sum them up. So we know on average, there'll be 0.3 of a broken egg in a box. So if I was to buy 10 boxes, well, logically, I'd expect three broken eggs. There's going to be 0.3 in each box. Now, variance was the other important measure. So expected value of x squared, well, if expected value of x is x times px, then expected value of x squared is x squared times px. Uh, mu is the expected value. And that's a measure of the spread. So how close to the middle the data is or how spread out it is. Now, the thing with variance, because we're squaring the x and we're squaring the average, whatever units our data is measured in, that means variance would be measured in units squared. It's probably more useful to have it the same units. So therefore, we have this thing called standard deviation. And we simply square root the variance, and that brings the units back to units rather than units squared. And that's, that's why we have standard deviation. And we often use sigma for that. So you can either think of it as sigma is the square root of variation or sigma squared is variation. So let's find the standard deviation. So I now add in my x squared px, work that one out. That sums to be 0 0.6. So the variance is 0.51. Find the square root of that, we get 0.714. Okay. So then we talked about relative frequencies. And the difference between relative frequency and probability, we, we tend to talk about probabilities when we have the whole sample space. We've got every piece of data. Whereas if we're just doing a sample, then we say, oh, it's the relative frequency. So we just look at the data we've got. Now, as the size of the sample gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then our relative frequency should get closer and closer to the theoretical or the actual probability. Students in year 12 were surveyed to find out the number of siblings students have. And there's our relative frequency distribution table now. So I'm now not calling it a probability distribution table. I'm now calling it a relative frequency distribution table. So there's all the frequencies. So divide it by 204, you get the relative frequency. Once again, they should all add up to be one. And then we also add in for this a cumulative frequency. So just adding up those relative frequencies as we go along. So the cumulative relative frequency. Construct a relative frequency histogram and polygon. So there's my histogram. The things you remember with histograms, when we're dealing with discrete data anyway, uh, we put the data in the center of the column. You'll notice, because my first one's naught here, I mean, I could have started it over here and had the column overlapping the axis. I mean, I could do that, but I just decided, no, that looks nicer to have naught over there. And then when we draw our polygon, 
we basically join it to halfway, so directly above that uh, label for each column. But then we join it up to the score that would be before. So if it was possible to have negative one siblings, so I join up to where that would be on my graph and seven would be the other one on the right hand side. Again, you know, some people like to have their histogram butt up straight against the axis and that's fine. It just means when you draw your histogram, uh, it'll start off to the left-hand side of the axis rather than the, the right-hand side. So let's draw that one in. So there's our polygon. So let's calculate the total area of those histograms. Amazingly, they turn out to be one. Now, it shouldn't be a huge surprise because remember we said all the probabilities add up to be one, all the cumulative frequencies. And that's really all we've got there. The height of each rectangle is the uh, relative frequency. And conveniently, my width is one, so therefore, when I add them up, I should get the sum of all the uh, probabilities. But let's have a look at the area under the actual polygon. I'm going to have to use a trapezoidal rule for this, of course, because I don't actually know the equation of the curve there. Oh, I suppose I could break them up into triangles and things like that, but that effectively is the same as the, the trapezoidal rule. So trapezoidal rule, what do you know? that area turns out to be one as well. This is why, and you've probably never ever been explained this before, but this is why we join to the spot before. You might have thought, well, when we draw in polygons, why on earth do we extend this polygon to the, the one before and the one after? It's so we can get that area underneath the curve to be one. Because there is a direct relationship between the area under both the histogram and the polygon and the total probability itself. So we're going to construct a cumulative relative frequency histogram and an OGIVE, fancy name for the, the polygon. So there's my cumulative frequency. Now with the OGIVE, this time we're drawing the diagonals in rather than going to the center. The five number summary. Now the five number summary, minimum Q1, Median, Q3, maximum. So there's the five numbers. It's a, I suppose a quick way of drawing, well not drawing, but it's a quick way of describing the box and whisker plot without actually drawing the box and whisker plot. So all right, here's the other guy. How can I do it from the graph? Well, the minimum is easy to read off, that's zero. Q1 is 25% of the data. So I, all I've got to do is go up on my probabilities here to 0.25 and read off the graph. Well, it's, it's one. The median would be 50% of the data, so that's one as well. Q3 would be 75%, that's two. And the maximum for this one is six. So there's our five number summary, zero, one, one, two, six. Interquartile range, that if you recall is the, the width of the box in the box and whisker plot. And so it's Q3 minus Q1, so two minus one is one. Okay, so that's a recap with discrete data before tomorrow we'll start looking at continuous data.